I've been asked to go quickly. Uh, the fortunate thing is that uh, I believe in just-in-time talk preparation. So when I was asked to go shorter, uh, I hadn't started my talk preparations yet. And this is why there's only some things you can do at runtime. So if you wait, to try to do as many things as you can at runtime. That's pretty much my view. So I ended up being a free software activist instead of a developer, uh, despite being in graduate school for computer science and studying compiler design. I first downloaded Linux in 1992. Uh, how many people in the room were not born yet in 1992? It's, uh, I mean, it's a Linux community, so it ages higher than most. But there are at least like five in the audience who weren't born yet when I first downloaded Linux. I didn't get it working until the beginning of 1993 to actually boot. Uh, and my first kernel that I ever booted was uh, 0 0.99 patch level 12. And I was also a student at that time, uh, I was undergraduate then, in a computer science department that didn't have a lot of resources. They'd paid a lot of money for uh, some really expensive hardware from DEC running Ultrix that wasn't very good. And I convinced the faculty over that summer of 1993 to hire me for the summer as a student employee to build a Linux lab using PCs, Pentium 90s at the time. And I got it mostly working. And so in September, when all the students came back, they all started using these, uh, what looked like PCs. But a lot of them would walk up, and the first thing they would do would be hit Control-Alt-Delete to try to get it back into Windows, because they saw this X login on this PC that they were surprised about. And there were also students using it remotely from their dorm rooms. We had like a little terminal server and you could telnet into boxes elsewhere on campus. So people would be logged in remotely and then somebody would walk up and hit control, delete, the whole thing would reboot and everybody would be surprised that the system was rebooting. So this, this caused me, I'd say I, I figured, I'm, you know, I have to put some code on slides because everybody else is a highly technical conference, I understand, and this is not a technical talk. But this part is vaguely technical. So I started, I grepped the source code of 0 0.99 patch level 12 for control of delete and found this in the keyboard, uh, the keyboard uh, stuff. And I was like, huh, so that just, uh, if it sees you pressing that keys, it just caused that function. Now this is my second year as a student. And I learned that anytime you find code that doesn't do what you expect, you should just comment it out. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I recompiled Linux and installed it. And indeed, Control-Alt-Delete stopped working and everything else kept working. So no one could reboot the machines by hitting that. Didn't log out the remote users anymore. And so I'd solved this problem. Now, there was no upstream. I don't think this patch would have been taken upstream. But <laughs> there was no upstream. <laughs> there was emailing Linus uh, if you had a working way to send email, which was hard to get sometimes in 1992. Um, I had a UUCP address, not a regular internet email address, and getting them to cross was, was an art. <laughs> it could be done, but it was hard. So I don't even know if I could have gotten an email to Linus. I don't think he would have taken this patch. And today I decided to recreate this because I didn't have the actual patch. I mean, patch had just been written by Larry Wall in these days. This is how long ago this is. So patch was new at that, mo at that time. Uh, so I, I, I downloaded the, all this uh, uh, last night and this morning and discovered that there was actually a variable I could have just set to zero. Uh, I still would have had to recompile, though, because there was no way to control this from user space in those days. Uh, but if I had set that to zero, it would have worked and was probably a better thing to do. Uh, and I've also, over the years, fantasized about the fact that there was no way to do anything with uh, rebooting from user space at all. Uh, at the time of 0 0.99. And I've sort of fantasized, well, what if I'd actually tried to do this correctly? I'd actually tried to like hook it up to user space, written, which didn't exist at that point, a sys5 init for Linux, which eventually did get written. And I would have ended up the sys5 init maintainer. And then 25 years later, I'd have a huge fight with Leonard Pottering. And I realized that my fantasy is not that great, actually, to end up as the sys5 maintainer. So it's probably better that I didn't try to do anything other than comment out that one line of code and recompile. But as silly as it was, commenting out this one line of code, it changed my life. Because while this was a trivial problem that I solved, I solved it because I had software freedom. I solved it because Linux was GPL'd. Because it was the first time I ever got a program that 
I actually had a problem with that I could figure out what it was and modify the software, as trivial as that modification was. And this showed me the obvious base case of software freedom. And it was clear that any bigger problem I might have, I was unbounded, bounded in fact only by my knowledge and my ability to learn how the program worked to make it do what I wanted it to do because it was under the GPL. And this really set my mindset for being a free software activist because I, I always believe, in that, and when I say this to upstream developers, you all get mad at me, but the downstream, what downstream can do is kind of the most important thing. It's not that upstream doesn't matter, it's there are limits on how much upstream matters because without downstream users, all the work you're doing doesn't have a tremendous amount of meaning. You might have fulfilling professional lives working upstream, but until someone downstream wants to use it for something, it doesn't mean all that much. You have to find people downstream that want to use your software, and you have to have users. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. It's <laughs> okay, there we go. So, so I, I'm on, I'm on uh, target and marketing uh, line for the conference then. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, might say, I might say it wrong. Uh, <laughs> I've been told I have to say BPF because we have to say BPF in every talk, apparently. <laughs> so, you know, BPF needs downstream users is what I'm supposed to say. Yes. And BPF's implementation is GPL, I should also say, right? That's true as well. So there, it's, it's on topic for my talk, too, that. Um, and, and when I look at the people who came up in my era, like the people that I knew from those days, Usenet, LKML didn't exist yet who became Linux developers, they became Linux developers primarily because they made it work on the hardware that was in front of them. In those days, it was their laptops, their desktops, and their servers was the only hardware in front of anyone, uh, more or less, at that point that they could port Linux to, but they did. Now, today, there are these billions and billions of small devices all running Linux. They're, Linux has become the standard for how to build embedded devices, pretty much any device you want to make, if it has a reasonable amount of power, you're going to pick Linux for it. Uh, uh, the, the joke in the 90s was Linux would run on your toaster. Well, I don't know if it runs on toasters yet, but it runs on refrigerators now, so it's pretty close. And the sad part is almost none of these devices out there, all the billions of devices running Linux, are actually in compliance with the GPL. Now. When I say that, most people groan because they tend to think, well, compliance with this GPL is this thing lawyers like. It has something to do with listing what license something is other, under and listing a copyright notice in the right place and all that legal boring stuff. That's never been what licensing is about for me. I wouldn't have gotten excited and concerned and wanting to work in licensing if it was about. For me, copyleft licensing at least was about getting the source code and doing something with it. Because the only value of free software licensing is that you're guaranteed source code that you can modify and do stuff with. And it, any compliance initiative that's focused primarily not on that, I think is a distraction. Because I like to focus on how do we get the source code? User has copy of Linux. Do they have the source code? Do they have the right source code? Does that source code build? Does it install? And this has had real important consequences, focusing on that part of compliance in our larger ecosystem of free software projects. In the early 2000s, this router came out, the WRT54G from Linksys, and it was the first mass-produced GPL-violating device, more or less, uh, that was put onto the market. And by, after about six to eight months, I, long, you can find longer talks of mine online, I tell the entire story, but the end of the story is, once the source code got released properly for that device, it launched a free software project called OpenWRT that is still the premier project for making a firmware that runs on wireless routers today. And it all started because a group of large coalition, including lots of organizations and other people, got together and said, we're going to enforce the GPL. We're going to assure we get this source code for this wireless router. And then developers got together and made it work on other things. And for many years, that was more or less the only alternative firmware project. Uh, 
And it's still by far the largest and most widely deployed on the different devices. And it was somewhat an accident of history. OpenWRT was the right source code release gotten through GPL enforcement at the right time and the right place to yield that project. And there was people waiting and ready to work on it. My view is that other projects haven't achieved this yet. And one of the reasons why is the kind of marriage between GPL enforcement and making cool firmwares to run on off-the-shelf hardware devices are not merged like they used to be. The entire time OpenWRT was on its rise and getting working on more wireless routers, Harold was suing people basically every six months in Germany for violations on wireless routers. And this is just the short list of ones he actually did press releases about of lawsuits that he filed. He also did dozens and dozens of other enforcement actions during that period. And that's the exact timeline of when OpenWRT was getting deployed on all these different router manufacturers' devices. And it was thanks to Harold doing that enforcement, getting the source code back downstream from you, but upstream from the original, from the original vendor right there at the OpenWRT project so they could get a version of OpenWRT working on all this different hardware. And so that's, that's the place where GPL enforcement and actual free software projects can meet to make something really important and exciting happen. And it's really because of these words in the GPL, which I think are the most important ones in GPL v2, Linux's license. It's not just that you need the source code that's upstreamable. A lot of developers tell me, well, if I can't see the dot, if it's not going to generate a new .c file for me, I'm not that interested in getting the product into compliance. That's true upstream. But your users care about a lot more because your users want to take the version of Linux that was distributed and compile and install it on the device that they have in front of them. And the words are there in the GPL that require that. And that's usually, at least in the embedded side, which is the largest deployments of Linux these days, what we're trying to achieve when we enforce the GPL. I have been misquoted about my views about Linux many times. I truly believe Linux is the most important GPL program ever written in history, by far. It's the most widely deployed. It's the most famous. It's got the most developers. Like any metric you use, Linux is the most important GPL program ever written. And my view is, which perhaps you disagree with, is that it's become that way because users got copies of Linux on their devices and started hacking on them. And because they could hack on their own devices that were in front of them is what inspired people to get excited about becoming Linux developers. And I think that's where the next generation of Linux developers comes from. I don't think it can remain the most important GPL program if people can't modify the copy of Linux that they have in front of them right now and figure out how it works and do interesting stuff with it. And probably, hopefully, just grab upstream and, and, and you know, get it working, because half these things have kernels that are like three years old. But if they can't get the kernel they have, they can't get to the kernel that's the right version. I believe tinkering with devices and making them do cool stuff is the most interesting part of having software freedom. Being able to do cool stuff with your software on your own devices is why I spend my life being a software freedom activist. So while OpenWT, I think, is doing very well, and I think that it's a success story, I would like to find a way to make another success story like that. I would like to find a class of devices out there, and if you have suggestions, please find me and talk to me about what you think it ought to be. Which, uh, people are already shouting out once. Let's talk, let's talk after they want me to finish quickly. But, but there's got to be a class of devices we can make it happen again. We can make a GPL enforcement married with a project to build a free firmware for a whole class of devices that are available on the consumer market and get software freedom for those dev devices. So let's talk offline about what ideas you have about that. I don't expect you all, as upstream Linux developers, to start an OpenWRT project. OpenWRT is downstream from you, as it should be. But 
the interesting place, the interesting um, role you have to play in all this is through the accident of how the GPL happens to work, the people who hold the copyrights have a tremendous amount of authority and power in deciding how the GPL operates in the world because the copyright holders under copyright law in pretty much every country in the world, at least every country that signed the Berne Convention on Copyright, are the entities or individuals who have the power to decide to enforce the GPL. So there's the place where you can help directly with GPL enforcement, and I'd love to talk to you more about if you'd be willing to do that. I realize we're in a world where independent developers don't have time to do GPL enforcement. Harold has not done GPL enforcement for many years, and I don't blame him. I've done it for most of my career. It is probably the most boring, mind-numbing, and complicated work you can imagine doing. Uh, it's constant negotiation, begging, and uh, desperately trying to get software to build that is incomplete. I don't expect any of you to want to do that work, and that's why Conservancy has done a lot of GPL enforcement on behalf of Linux developers, so you don't have to spend the time doing that. There are unethical people out there doing GPL enforcement. You've probably heard that Patrick McCarty did a bunch of that. There's some links in the abstract of my talk that you can read about that mess. But those that ethically do enforcement generally don't get money from it. What generally happens is we fund our work through charitable donations to do GPL enforcement in places where it's strategically important for users. And by making sure that we're prioritizing getting source code over a financial reward, uh, because that's not what it's about from our point of view, means that it's a charitable activity in the end. So if you'd like to help in any way with doing GPL enforcement by getting involved with our coalition of folks who do GPL enforcement, or generally if you have questions, please let us come see me tonight or tomorrow I'll be here all day as well. And with that, I'm going to finish. They asked, asked me to finish in less than half an hour, which I think I've done. Um, should I do Q&A or no? What's that? Can I go with questions or no? Uh, one, or one or two questions I can go with, and then they want to do the auction. All right, I'm really bad at throwing things. I'm going to hit somebody in the head with this thing, I'm sure. OK, mm. one question. How do you put regulation uh, into this uh, picture? Because right now, I would say that I work in the automotive industry. And I would say that uh, fighting for this uh, GPL and how to push our uh, uh, employer to, to publish and to fulfill the obligation, it's, uh, it's already a tough uh, job. But on top of that, we have to take care of uh, all the regulations that are coming in. Mm -hmm. And for example, with uh, connected car and uh, autom autonomous car, right now, the issue is that uh, how can we expect that at some point you, you will never be able to update uh, Linux kernel in the current picture? And I don't know how to make this possible. Yeah, and, and what you're saying right now is exactly what Broadcom said about the wireless industry during the very first GPL enforcement action that I ever worked on, the Linksys violation. They said, oh, you, you'll never see free software or wireless device drivers. The regulatory climate is so strict, and we're going to get arrested in Japan if we release wireless drivers. And of course, there have been many wireless drivers and firmwares released at this point. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody being arrested in Japan, as I was told by Broadcom would happen, for sure, if the, ever one was released. Um, I, realize that I realize I'm being a little bit glib because the automotive industry is more complicated. Um, but uh, there was a talk that I gave with BN Webster uh, at the Automotive Linux Summit where we actually walked through how do you do GPL compliance with Linux and also meet the automotive regulation. So I'm happy to send you the slides of that talk after, and, and I don't know if it was recorded or not, but, uh, but if it's recording, it might be online somewhere. Yeah, thank you. And I've proposed that talk elsewhere, but nobody's accepted it again yet. So if you want to encourage these Linux places to invite me and BN to come back and give that talk, I'm sure we would love to give it again. OK, real quick. I know it was like a joke with the BPF, but actually it was a little bit serious. And I kind of made a joke on Twitter saying BPF will replace Linux. One thing, because you said the main thing people want to do is they want to tinker. They want to modify what they have. They have a problem, they do it. Actually, I think BPF will actually be a strong, or will actually move into that. Uh, your talk's not much different than what uh, David gave. He says, without BPF, Linux will become kind of obsolete. 
Why? Because users want to modify things more so than Extreme <coughs> wants to. And in a lot of ways, believe it or not, it's slightly different. It's slightly different point of view, but it's something you might want to think about too. That you still can modify things. You're making it modifiable, although you still want the source, still want to compile things, but you might still be able to do what you want to do with the help of something like API. Yeah, and it's, it's not that I, I, I think that having an API, more APIs is better. I mean, and basically, that's always true. It's API, uh, it's, a, it's a language. A language, but my point is more hooks into being able to do your own stuff outside of the upstream is useful. But in the end, having all the source code of the GPL program makes a difference because there will be people who want to write better device drivers. There will be people who want to do all sorts of things. And just make a, just making your own firmware for a lot of these embedded things, you've got to have the full source code to Linux. So it still matters. I agree with you that anything Linux can do to make people excited about being developers, I think is incredibly valuable. And make people excited about working in the Linux community doing development. All that's great. But I still think the GPL matters too uh, as part of it. It's, it's a big picture, I agree. All right, I've been told to end questions at this time. So I'll be around t tonight and tomorrow if you want to ask more. Okay, so I'm the last one of the day, and my job will be to do auction uh, in favor of the software uh, conservancy. So just a warning, um, many of you know me, and uh, my challenge of this presentation will be a presentation uh, without any single word wrote writing on my presentation, so only GIFs. You saw me, I'm sending a lot of GIFs on Twitter or on anything. So everything will be about GIF for this auction. So if you know me, don't worry, it's just a robbery. I'm just here to take the money out of your pockets. No, in fact, I'm just making a, an auction. And so your role in this game would be to donate to this guy. Not me personally. Not. <laughs> we'll, manage, we'll manage this after, afterward. <laughs> so to tweak that, uh, I've been I just brewed some beers, so here you have the bottle in front of you. And all the fantastic speakers of this edition are signing these bottles. So my game would be to take as much as possible money from these bottles. And this is the same beer as you tested during the lunch, so I hope you enjoyed it. So this is the first trick. The second one is uh, selling a, right, um, a drawing from Frank. So I will put it also on the auction. And not no. Last but not least, this wonderful paper boat. And one of the guys yesterday decided to make it signed by all the uh, speakers. So my job is to make it signed and to make it uh, sold at, at a good price. You cannot ignore that I found a gift with a paper boat and cats. So Dave, this is for you. So this is what I'm expecting from you. So throw your money, and I would be happy about it. <laughs> hey. So I'm taking everything. I think I'm pretty heavy right now. So I'm taking dollars. <laughs> I'm taking euros. 
I let it go a little, just to be sure that it prints. I'm taking pounds. No. <laughs> In fact, I'm kidding. I'm sorry, Will. I'm sorry, uh, Bam. We don't take any more uh, the Brexit dollars. Uh, but we are taking bitcoins, so you can exchange if you like. Uh, we are much more confident in bitcoins than in uh, pounds today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's start with the first bottle. So it's 105 liters. It's brown beer. And I will start the auctions at uh, 20 euros. So who for 20? Please raise your hand. Olivier, thank you. Who for 25? 30, thank you, Pascal. 35. 35 to my left, thank you. 40. Thank, thank you, Marek. 45. 50, thank you, William. 55. Pascal, 2. 60. Okay, let's try to speed up. <laughs> Ufa, 60, please. 60. Thank you. 65. Don't worry, there is many, but also sale. 65. Thank you. 70. 70. 71 time. 72 times. 70. Thank you. 75. Anyone for 75? One time, two time. 75. 80. That start to be tricky at yeah, ATV. <laughs> go on, go on, go on. No, 85. 90. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 95. 95 one time. Two time. And three times. Thank you. So the bank is at the entrance of the room, so don't uh, be scared. You cannot exit with the, with the beers, and we'll keep the doors. Uh, at some point, you will have to pay. Um, second one. So there is the same size. So let's stay with start at uh, 50, because we got a nice price for the first run. So ho for 50. Pascal, 55. 60. Who for 60. 70, thank you, William. 75? Oh, I have two of them. So maybe one of the two is 80? Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> 80 is down. 85. 85. Looks like we have a price for this kind of bottle. 85? You can do it. <laughs> 85. One time? Two time? Three time, thank you. So, bring it in. So, let's do it again. Um, I will go on the penguin side. Let's change for the beer. So, you maybe saw the speaker. That's not the right one. <laughs> so, it's a blank page if anyone wants to put an auction on it. No, sorry. Uh, Frank made the, for the guy who sketched up you during the conference, made a nice sticker you can see on my laptop. You sure you got some. And here we have uh, the original sketch that I will put on the auction. Thank you, Frank, for giving us the original drawing for that. So I don't know what price we can start, maybe 20. So who would be interested in, in this original sketch up for 20? Thank you, Anis. 20. 25? 100. 100? Well. <laughs> <laughs> 100. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Anyone for 105? Maybe? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying. It's where I mean. That's why. Come on. 105? Come on. The penguin is asking. It's not me. No, 100. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rufan. Thank, thanks a lot. 
So let's be back to beer. <laughs> so let's restart from 50. I'm sure you can do it. So who for 50? Maybe William? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, William. <laughs> 55, Pascal? Thank you, 60. Yeah, 60, thank you, Vincent. 80. 80. So cool, my colleagues are fighting. 80. <laughs> 85. Where is Matthew? Matthew, 85. <laughs> no, 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 I don't want to force. 80. Who's for 85? 81 time. 82 times. 83 times. Thank you, William. So now let's time to do it. It's much, much more trickier. So le let me describe it. This is the menu from yesterday restaurant with such a nice service. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. The pen is inside. I didn't use that object before. So this is the menu from yesterday, which is and it was a marvelous service and. Um, it's signed by the uh, speakers. So let's start at, <laughs> I, I will take the price on it. It's, it seems it's right. Uh, let me check, it's right, nine euros. So let's start from nine. Who for nine euros? I have one, 10, 20, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. 25, 25, thank you, 30. 30, Pascal, Patrick, thank you. 35. 35. Please. 60, 60 Marek. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> One more time, I'm sorry. I have to, I have to knee down. <laughs> 60. Come on, people. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> if I do the sum of all the prices, it's much more than 60. I mean. So 60, one time. 70. Wow. 80? <laughs> oh, <it's laughs> you're amazing people. <laughs> 80. <laughs> amazing. 80. Anyone else? 100 for, <laughs> 100 for Patrick. Okay. Um, who's next? After 100? I have to need down also for you, Patrick. <laughs> so, one time? Two time? 120. 125. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> this is not very nice, my girl, not that nice. 120? After that, I put my clothes off. Uh, <laughs> why am I saying that? I'm stupid. I, should, I shouldn't say that. 120? One time? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> So 125? 27. Oh, I'm lost. 127. <laughs> With more? A few options after that. I don't know. One time? Two times? <laughs> Down. <laughs> You're crazy people. <laughs> I'm lost. Uh, where are we? One, one thirty. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> one thirty. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a cat. I mean, the cat is asking. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> Accepted. I give you a <laughs> <laughs> one time. Two times. One fifty. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, I will f end naked. Um, 150 then. 150, it's uh, really changing, I mean, for this beautiful <laughs> paper board. With a pen, it's, it's included. 150, one time, two times. 
<laughs> I have to apologize one minute. Sorry, we will be late. <laughs> I tried to make it short, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, you said I'm sorry. I'm 170. <laughs> I'm lost. 170. <laughs> No, we have also this part to sell after that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyone else? One time. I'm scared. Two times. Three times. Oh my God, you made it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much, man. Have you, seen, have you ever seen that before? No. <laughs> no uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so let's back to a beer. So this one is still signed by all the people. So please be quicker because it's pretty heavy. Um, <laughs> it's two liter. So let's start at uh, 60. 100. 100. OK. Let's go. So. Uh, 100 already. Anyone? 120. Thank you, Mathieu. 120. Anyone else? 130. Oh, for 130 or more. You can say more. You can chat 150. <laughs> <laughs> so 120. Okay. You can actually do it. <laughs> 120. One time, a paper boat costs more than a bottle of beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no one is getting up. One, two. One more time, I have to put. No, come on. Uh, uh. <laughs> One, Wendy. One time, two time. <laughs> you like it, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so someone? So, three times. Thank you, Mathieu. <laughs> uh, see, see, she's signed. Here. It's signed here. Okay, it's pretty weird. Um, in fact, I told you that I will make only GIFs, so I wrote can I recipes into a GIF uh, on Giphy, and this is the result. So, uh, because I'm sending this, so for any company which is making some advertisement inside their company, this is the original series signed by also the speakers. I would give it to my base poop. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. So. Let's start at, at 20 euros. Anyone? 20 euros, thank you. Oof. 50 euros, thank you. It would be nice in our offices. After. 50 then. 60, someone? Cool, I will be able to see it every day. Oh, no, 60. <laughs> A 100, wow. That becomes serious. 100. Anyone else? Okay, well let's. It's a one time offer. It's buy one, get one. So, 100. Anyone? One time? 120. Thank you, Patrick. Who for maybe 130 or 140? Anyone? One time? Two times, three times. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Last one. This two-liter bottled beer, which is drinking by a cat. I decided to finish with a cat. I mean, it was a part of the topic. So let's start at uh, 50. A hundred, Pascal? Two hundred. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Two hundred. I keep my clothes at that price. But, um, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so that would end very badly. 200. Anyone? It's two liters. So it's <laughs> And you can share it with anyone. And I suggest you also to make some posts on Twitter when you will drink it with your friends or maybe with the speakers. I don't know. For anyone for 200? More than 200, sorry. Yeah, let's try your first sheet. <laughs> Please. No? Doesn't work? Okay, let's try another one. <laughs> Please. No, one time, two times, and three times. Thank you, Mathieu. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. So this is the end of this auction. Thank you all for attending this gift presentation in favor of the software conservancy. It's also time to party. So. Uh, uh, Criterio is very happy to invite you, all, the, all uh, over everyone that have been registered, which is meaning almost everyone, uh, to a party which will take place at uh, 32 uh, Rue Blanche. So in Blanche Street, it's pretty close from here. We can go and uh, make a global uh, walk by to, to, to get there. And you will have, if the weather is good enough, we might be able to get to the rooftop, which is one of the best ones. And uh, you would see one of the best view of Paris. So it would be a kind of halfway to continue this uh, Paris trip uh, with all of you. Yes, so for the uh, organization, don't forget your badge because the security guy at the entrance will request you to have your badge unless you will be ejected. In that case, call us, send us a tweet or uh, call us and we'll try to manage it. But please try to keep your badge with you. It will uh, make the entrance much more easier. And also, uh, we'll try to make some group uh, some group sat seeing of the rooftop because we are still part inside the company and we cannot let you running inside the company because the building is pretty complex. So we'll ask you to stay in groups and we'll bring you, uh, we'll try to get it at least two times maybe, one time during the day, one time during the night to have a very nice uh, sightseeing. So I hope you, I'm sorry, please. No? Yes. I want to just thank everybody who bid and uh, was willing to donate money to the Software Freedom Conservancy. We we'll use it to help um, the GPL and enforce the GPL and make the world better for software freedom. I also want to thank Hubstream for organizing this conference. Organizing conferences is very difficult, and it's why there are so few community events like this. So you have a real valuable resource here in having a conference like this because not many conferences are community organ or organized, all technical, all with everybody having an opportunity to speak. So this is a wonderful event that they put together and you should be very grateful, I think, for their great work to make it happen. And I will just ask you a set of applause also for Han, which is managing all the conferences, doing almost all the job. So thank you, Han.